Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. Here's what we have in store for you for this November 20th, 2013 edition. Tonight, government demands blood or saliva randomly from Texas drivers. Then, J.P. Morgan's given a record $13 billion penalty by the government, 85% tax deductible. And will free speech die in Dallas 50 years later? All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. Our top story tonight, Texas drivers pulled over at random, told to turn over blood and saliva samples. But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at the clip. They were asking for cheek swabs. Um, they would pay you $10 cash for that. Um, they would also, if you let them take your blood, they would pay you $50 for that. It doesn't seem right that you would be forced off of the road when you're not doing anything wrong. There's the fine print on the form given to drivers. It informs them their breath was tested when they first stopped by, quote, passive alcohol sensor readings before the consent process has been completed. They're essentially lying to you when they say, hey, this is completely voluntary. Now, this is nothing new here in the state of Texas. For some reason, I don't know if Texas is a giant beta test or what's going on, but we see these roadside cavity searches. We have these no refusal DUI weekends in some places like San Antonio. It's uh, every day of the year, and it's not just here in the state of Texas, but it's been hitting here pretty hard recently. And you can see the, the article right there on your screen. And they'll pull you over, they'll draw your blood, and this is just another thing. And you heard, they say, well, we'll pay you for it this time. We'll, we'll pay you for your blood, we'll pay you for your saliva and all this stuff. Well, you still forced me off the road. Why are you doing this here in the great state of Texas? And something else that is right in the great state of Texas, we have this jury finds C.J. Grisham guilty of interfering with police duties. Now, C.J. Grisham is the president of Open Carry Texas. You can see their Facebook page right there. And basically, uh, Mr. Grisham was... Uh, earlier this year, rudely displaying, claims the officer who arrested him, his rifle when he was walking down the street with his son. The officer arrested him for not complying with uh, his totalitarian wishes. And eventually, uh, Mr. Grisham went to, went to trial. I was there the first day of his original trial. That ended in mistrial, and now the new jury has given him a guilty verdict. Now, he is planning to fight this. Now, I do want to point out to people that C.J. not only served his country, but currently serves his country. He is active duty military. So a man who is willing to die to put his life on the line to defend rights, dare come home, and says, I want my rights here in the States, and then they say, no way. So my support does go out to C.J. Grisham and also the members of Open Carry Texas. Now this, father arrested for trying to pick up kids from school. Now this gentleman, he goes to school and he says, I wanna pick up my child because he doesn't want his child to walk home alone. He doesn't want the hassle of having to drive to the school. And you can see the gentleman right there. He calmly debates uh, with this officer, the sheriff, and the sheriff basically arrests him for disagreeing with him. And he says, uh, you, you, you're being childish, you're doing all this, you're all doing all that. So this is a situation, we've seen this before, where they don't want you to pack your, your kids' lunches. And we even had an article out today talking about how a woman was charged $10 because she didn't put all the necessary crackers and stuff that the school said she had to have in her lunch. But staying on topic with this, this is the police state coming to your school. And it is a lengthy clip, so I do encourage you to go to InfoWars.com and see the whole deal for yourself. But he says, I don't want to have to wait an hour and a half to pick up my child. I just want to pick up my child now. And the officer said, pretty much, we'll give your child when we're good and ready. And you can see it on your screen right there, as I alluded to earlier, a woman charged $10 because she didn't put all the rich crackers and whatever else the school says that she should have in her child's lunch. Maybe the kid doesn't like rich crackers, and even if you think the child was somehow malnourished, 10 bucks for a pair, for a pack of crackers, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. Now, something else that is really, truly ridiculous, and I've seen this on the internet, but I didn't know how big of a deal it actually was, police. Example of troubling knockout game popping up all over it. Now, like I said, I'd seen this before on the internet, you know, stupid guys, they run around and they punch people in the back of the head and they run off. And I mean, like, that's very unfortunate. But I didn't realize how big of an issue this actually is. This is going up all over. And I will say that in many of these videos I have seen, the, not just these two that you're, you're seeing right now, but in many of these videos that I have seen, 
It's usually young black males attack, attacking people of other races, especially if they're females or elderly. So you got these young punks running around punching people, running off and somehow thinking that they're cool. Now this is especially prevalent in the city of New York, and I know New Yorkers have enough stuff to worry about, but uh, you know, be careful when you're on the subways, you're walking down the street, especially if you're elderly or a woman, because these guys may just run up and punch you in the back of the head and then put it on YouTube. I don't, I don't know how these guys have avoided capture, but definitely watch yourself. Now, somebody was watching J.P. Morgan, and they actually got charged. They, they got caught with something for once. So we see this article, J.P. Morgan in record $13 billion settlement with U.S. authorities. Now, while I am happy that the, the big banks are actually being charged and fined, $13 billion over a bank's entire history isn't really a whole lot of money. But regardless, I'm glad that they've been charged with something. So you can go to that article and see that full report for yourself. Now, we're going to end tonight with this. Rand Paul hints at 2016 presidential run. I think they want someone outside of, you know, what's been going on, Paul said referring to the political sideshow in Washington. For example, someone like myself who has been promoting term limits, Paul told Fox News Monday. So regardless if you agree with everything Rand Paul does or what his father did, you know, I think this guy is definitely better than most and better than pretty much any other option we're going to have in 2016. So at least think about it. you got plenty of time. Now, something that you don't have a lot of time for is the JFK assassination that's going on right now. Well, not the current assassination, obviously, but the coverage of the assassination and not just the assassination, but the First Amendment trials and tribulations that are going on right now in the city of Dallas, Texas. That's why InfoWars is there right now. And you can join Alex and the rest of the crew at the uh, at the Federal Reserve Building right there in Dallas, Texas. So if you're in Dallas, if you plan to be there during the event, Get to the Federal Reserve tonight. They're going to be handing out posters. They're going to have speeches and rallies and different things that you can find on that article. If we can scroll back up to the top so people can see the headline, so people can go and find this for yourself. It has the events for today, but not just today, but for the rest of the week. So you don't want to miss this stuff. Check it out. JFK 50th anniversary fight for free speech. And this is what it's about. We'll be handing out posters, poster boards, flyers, all kinds of things that a lot of surprises I can't talk about right now, but they hope to see you right there in Dallas, Texas coming up this weekend. There's a lot of great things waiting for you starting tonight right there in the city of Dallas. And don't forget, it starts tonight if you're watching this live on PrisonPlanet.tv in not too much time, 8 p.m. Federal Reserve, you want to be there. And you can also check out the live streams at InfoWars.com forward slash show. Now, if you want to support the broadcast, you can stop by PrisonPlanet.tv and pick up your 15-day free trial. You can get the Alex Jones Show, the nightly news, the rants, all that right there at PrisonPlanet.tv. Now, stay tuned because after this break, David Knight will be talking to Gerald Salente about a different aspect of the JFK assassination you may not have seen before. straight to Pearl Street for the uh, Federal Reserve protest. We'll be passing out 30,000 flyers. We got about 100 posters. And uh, so if you're getting this on Ustream right now, then head on down there. We'll see you there in about an hour from now. It's like 6.30 Central. And we will be there by uh, 7.30, passing those out. And we want everybody to be there, all the activists out there. We are going to not let the city of Dallas stifle the First Amendment in Dallas, Texas on the 50th anniversary of JFK. They've already paved over the street where the bullet holes were because they want to rewrite history and we're not going to let them do that. So we will see you there. This is Rob Dew signing off. This is a conspiracy by the technocrats, by the ruling elite, by the eugenicists that want to dumb us down. This is the iodine conspiracy. Our government wasn't always a eugenicist-based predatory group. Back in the 1920s, the federal government pressured salt manufacturers and bread producers to add iodine because they knew that iodine deficiencies were causing massive decreases in IQ, birth defects, and it was a health crisis all across the United States and in Europe as well. In the decade after iodine was added to staple foods, 
there was a 15 point increase in IQs in the areas that had previously been deficient. So what did the federal government do a couple decades later? They took the good halogen iodine out and added another bad one, bromine. And they put the worst of the group, fluoride and fluorine derivatives, in our water supply and began using it as a pesticide on the crops. Let's be clear about this. Adding bromine to the food supply is banned in the EU, banned in Canada, and banned in many other nations because it is a toxic poison listed in those countries. I've done deep research on the globalist program to dumb down the population to make us more manageable. It is eugenics. And I personally take the highest quality form of unbound iodine, nascent iodine, in a kosher certified, non-GMO certified glycerin base. I've interviewed the experts, people like Dr. Brownstein and pharmacist Ben Fuchs, and of course, Dr. Edward Groot, and across the board, the consensus is iodine is the missing piece of the puzzle. And not just iodine, but high quality, unbound, pure iodine. Bottom line, this is something on record our bodies need. I've gone out and found the best source for myself and my family. I hope you'll visit InfoWarsLife.com and get our InfoWars Life Survival Shield. It really does incredible things. And we've got nothing but positive reviews from our listeners. And this also helps support our news operation and the InfoWar while we get the iodine we need and block the fluoride and the other members of the halogen that are so bad for our bodies check out the information. Do the research for yourself, talk to your physician, and then decide whether you want to drink fluoridated water that Harvard major studies admits is giving people brain cancer and bone cancer and lowering their IQ, or whether you want to find a high quality source of iodine. Consult your physician, do your research, and make a decision. But whatever you do, don't just ignore this message because all of my research shows this is absolutely key to getting people out of the brain fog that they've been artificially put into by the social engineers. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today. Well, our guest tonight is Gerald Salenti, and he was a witness to a very important, I would say confession, from Governor Connolly, the first time he had visited the site of the JFK assassination since he was in the car with JFK and was shot along with JFK. It was 30 years after the assassination and it was 20 years ago, shortly before he died. And he had a lot of things that he wanted to get off of his chest and a lot of amazing revelations. So here with that story is Gerald Salente. Welcome Gerald Salente. It's great to talk to you. Well, thanks for having me on. Now, you're all about trends and Trends Journal, and here's one trend that I think is kind of alarming. We've seen for decades that 80% of the people don't believe the government's official story about the JFK assassination. 10% did, and another 10% were like, uh, who's JFK? Now we're seeing those numbers drop. It's still two to one that don't believe the government's official story, but now that's down to about 60-30, and it seems to be falling. What do you think's behind that trend of people starting to believe the official story, no matter how preposterous? <laughs> As time goes by, people forget, you know, so you have generations that weren't around when it happened and haven't seen all the information that puts question into what really happened and who did what. So as time goes by, you know, history uh, fades away. So new people coming in have really no relationship to the past. That's and right. Only, and only know what's being told to them. And one of the things that's real important to have you on, it's one we wanted to talk to you today, was because of your relationship to the past. It was 30 years ago that you were able to talk to Governor Connolly, and it was the first time that he had revisited the area since the shooting. And he had some interesting things to tell you about the shooting as well as talking about the future, didn't he? It was 1992, October 25th, just before the 1992 elections. And I got a call that John Connolly wanted to meet me. I got it on a Wednesday, and he wanted me to fly down to Dallas to meet him on a Sunday. He had read my book, Trend Tracking, that I wrote in 1989. Now, remember, this is the 92 elections. It's George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, and Ross Perot. When I wrote Trend Tracking back in 89, I said that there would be a new third party. 
you know, people were pretty disgusted back then as well. And it was actually more of a movement for a third party than there isn't even today, even though people are more disgusted today. And for some reason, I mentioned Ross Perot as the type of political maverick. So Connolly wanted to meet me to see how I figured this out and to see what was going to happen with the elections and what would happen afterwards. He was impressed with the work. So I flew down there, and we had lunch at the Anatole Hotel. It was myself, a fellow by the name of John J. Hooker from Tennessee. Hooker ran for uh, governor of Tennessee, barely lost. And he was a real gadfly. He was against the corporations and the rich funding campaigns. And actually, he was the guy that put Ross Perot on with Larry King. And if people go back to that time, it was on Larry King that Ross Perot announced that he was going to run for president. So it was, it was Hooker, myself, at lunch with uh, Pat Cadell, the pollster. Cadell was actually he was polling for uh, Ross Perot as well. And Perot was skyrocketing in the polls on this October 25th. It was a real horse race. Remember, Perot got almost 20% of the vote. And if you go back and watch that day on October 25th, they also aired 60 Minutes that day. And that was the time when Perot said he dropped out of the race during the summer because of his daughter's wedding and some other stuff. And he looked like a lunatic, and he really dove in the polls. That's when he jumped the and shark. another woman was... Excuse me? Yeah, that's when he jumped the shark, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was about it. And the other person there was Rama Fox, which was Larry King's girlfriend at the time, his fiance. And so Larry King was involved in this, and she was there that day. And David, as we're having lunch, and remember, I'm the outsider there. You can see by this photograph of me and Connolly in front of the book depository. You know, I'm not one of the guys. And, but as Connolly's speaking, I'm interrupting the other people and stopping them so I could hear what he was saying. And I have to tell you that I didn't like Connolly before I met him. What I knew of him was only what I knew on the media and, and hearing him and, and reading about him. And as he started speaking, the first emotion that went over me was embarrassment. I was embarrassed for having prejudged him. Mm. And every word that he was speaking was like a sentence, and every sentence was like a paragraph. Everything he was saying made sense to me. It reaffirmed what I already knew, but it really put it into the truest context. So I kept interrupting these people so he could talk. And as we finish lunch, Hooker booms out, well, John, the limousine's waiting for us. We were going to the book depository. This is Connolly's first time back since the assassination. He didn't even go to it when they made it a museum back in 1989. So the four of us pile into the, into the, the limousine along with his wife, Nellie. And remember, this is their first time back, and we're parked out in front, and he starts telling the story. Now, remember, the front of the, the book depository is not where we see where allegedly Lee Harvey Oswald was with a gun. That's the side of the book depository. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting across from, from Connolly, and he starts telling the story of what happened that day. He said, I heard a gunshot. He said, I looked over to my right, he said, I knew it was a gunshot because I've been hunting since I'm a little boy. Now, remember, we're parked out in front of the book depository. So looking over to his right is looking over at the grassy knoll, hmm. where people say they first heard the gunshot coming from. Wow. He explained how he was scrunched up in the jump seat. They had jump seats in those days in the limousine. And he said he was wearing a dark blue suit that day, holding his Stetson hat on his knee. And he said, I looked over to my left and there were brains on my shoulder. He said, I know there were brains because my daddy was a butcher. Mm. And then they went on to explain what happened, how Nelly, how he, he went, he, oh, he went like this, he said. He said, then I felt as though there was a pounding on my back, and I'll never forget the way he, he had his fists and his face distorted. And that's when he said he went flying forward when the bullet ripped through his back, mm. through his chest, through his hand, and through his knee. 
And that's when Nellie threw herself on top of him. Wow. And then Connolly goes on to say that in this chaos, they got to Parkland Hospital in about 10 or 12 minutes. He said it's usually about a 20 minute ride. And as life would have it, as the motorcade comes screaming into Parkland, there's this doctor that's on break and sees the motorcade and he goes running down to the emergency room. And it turns out that this is the doctor that works on Connolly. But the doctor happened to be a thoracic surgeon. Wow. What are the odds of that? Just what he needed. A lung wound. His lung is blown open. And he gets a thoracic surgeon to work on him. I mean, you go to an emergency room, you're lucky if anything happens. That's right. Now, remember, Nellie is on top of him. He's, he's over, bent over, his hand compressed to his chest. That's what saved his life, as Connolly told it. Because the lung wound, the, the, you know, the, when the hole comes out, it's even bigger than when it goes in. The air, he would have suffocated from it. But because of the compression, and of course because he gets a thoracic surgeon to work on him, he lives. Hmm. We, we get outside and we start taking photographs. This woman, Rama, had a, there's a Polaroid camera that she took the shot with. And as we're out there, all of a sudden, from nobody out there, hundreds of people are coming around. They're saying, oh, there's John Connolly, there's John Connolly. He was very gracious, by the way. Other people are taking photos with him. We get back in the car, and I'm sitting across from him, and all of a sudden it clicked in me. I said, this guy's ready to die. He's speaking like a dying man. Huh. Remember, he has a lung wound. I have a photograph here. I don't know if you can see it or not. This is my father, may his soul rest in peace, just before he died. Had a going away party for him. Ah. You can look at his hands, he has these big red splotches on him. My father died of asbestos poisoning from working in the shipyards. Connolly was on heavy doses of prednisone back then. His pulmonary condition was acting up again. And they had, I think it was adhesions that he had or something and they were trying to stop the, the swelling and, and the discomfort. So they put him on prednisone like they did my dad. And Connolly had these purple splotches. And when you look at that photo of me and him, he's hunched over. And that's what starts to happen. So I knew that this, I seen this picture before. And I said to Hooker later that day, John Hooker, I said, Connolly's going to die soon. And he did. He died in, in June of the following year. Again, remember, we meet in October of 1992. He died in June of 1993. And we kept in contact, by the way, up until April. You know, Gerald, that reminds me very much of uh, Robert McNamara. Just before he died, they filmed that documentary he got with uh, the documentary filmmaker and really kind of confessed about everything that he had done in Vietnam, even going back to World War II. Uh, and, and the same sort of thing is happening here, I think, with John Connolly. You know, they, they've kept these secrets, and they know they don't have much time. They know that they're dying, and they really want to make a confession to somebody. So just like uh, McNamara talked to the filmmaker, Errol Morris, he's kind of telling you what happened, telling you that he heard shots coming from the grassy knoll. Yeah, and they also said he and Nellie, they repeated several times that they heard three shots. We heard three shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, they kept saying that. So now we're going back to the hotel, we get back in the limo, and there's complete silence, no one's saying anything. Remember, I'm sitting across the room, we pull up, the other four people get out, he and I are the last to walk in, and he stops me just as we get to the doors, and he looks at me and he said, I read your book, Trend Tracking. He said, it's a fine piece of work. He said, I know your heart's in the right place. He said, you don't have a clue what's going on in the government. And neither did the American people. He said, because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Hmm. Now remember, this is coming from the guy who was the governor of Texas when he got shot. He goes on to become the United States Treasury Secretary. By the way, at a time when the United States finally pulled itself completely off the gold standard. Yeah. He's the guy that ostensibly told Richard Nixon to pack up his gear, the game was over. 
-hmm. And he's telling me, a guy from the inside at the highest level, that if the American people knew what was going on, there'd be a revolution in this country. Now, that was 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Look how obvious it is now at the levels of corruption. Hey, the Defense Department doesn't know what happened to $8.5 trillion, according to Reuters. This isn't a left-wing operation. This is a mainstream as you can get. Yeah. One, one, one criminal activity after another, and he's putting it right at the heart of where it is, the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And no matter what we find out, no matter how bad it is, whether it's Benghazi or the next scandal or the next scandal, they just move on. They, have, they replace one scandal with another one and nobody, nothing is ever done. We find out that they're spying on everybody's records and they, they admit it, but then they want to jail the guy who exposed their criminal activity, do nothing to reform it. Exactly. And, and by the way, it's the entire system. Yes. So that people think that, oh, there's a candidate in the Republican Party or there's a candidate in the Democratic Party and they're going to make a difference? You know, grow up. You're not going to change the bloods of the Crips or the Bananos or the Gambinos. Absolutely. It's a mafia. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's an amazing story. And like I said, I think after 30 years after the assassination, he'd kept this all pent up. He had never gone back there. He went back there and you were with him when he went back to the scene of the assassination and he really wanted to get that off of his chest. Amazing revelations and amazing what he was predicting would happen in the future that uh, so many things that we've seen, isn't it? Yes, it is. And actually, it's time for the revolution. Yes. And of course, uh, and I, I keep saying this, so I want to make it really clear. I'm talking not a violent one. I'm talking right. about a moral, spiritual and an intellectual revolution. You know, we could change this with our, by us doing it in a proper way. And yeah, I have to say to you that never before has the opportunity been better because the vacuum is so large. Look at Absolutely. Washington. Look Absolutely. at Obama's poll ratings. Look what people think about Congress. 10% approval rating for Congress. So the time is now. Yes. And Connolly was ahead of his time. Absolutely. After 20 years, we've seen exactly what he was talking about. And I hope that we can bring that to fruition, a nonviolent revolution. Because if we don't get a nonviolent revolution, it's going, the government's going to get increasingly violent. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Salenti. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for sharing that. That was an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's exactly right. We need a nonviolent revolution. We've seen a total revolution in the way the government acts, and it's a matter of educating people. And if you want to spread the information, you can become a subscriber to Prison Planet TV. It helps us support our operation here, and it's a way that you can pass information on to your friends and family. Up to 10 other people can view it simultaneously with you. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. Okay, John, uh, well, uh, give us a report on what you've seen and... Uh, uh, feel is, uh, the, hypo the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Look at this. They're digging up the X that marks the spot. What are they going to do next? Move the street? They're just going to move the whole street so that we can uh, erase the history. And behind those barricades, we were shooed away by a guy that claims that we got to have a $50 permit to go over there, which I'm sure Infowars.com puts a permit in. We're not staying over there. I bet they, they try to put the cuffs on us, but can you believe this? Are you there? Yes, you're at Daily Plaza. Continue giving us a report. So this is big news. They're tearing yep. up the X that's been there for 40 years. It was put Bust in you. 10 years, 10 years after the uh, shooting. They are actually tearing up the road. And I was told, Jim Mars was saying this, I, I can see they're doing it. They're tearing out the curbs that have the bullet uh, marks on them. So they're actually expunging right. history right now. 
They're they are covering up the lie right now as we speak. Okay, sir, we want to know about your view on these restrictions of the free speech here, of them digging the ground up, uh, the, the crew that's pushing everybody out, and the fact that we're going to be restricted from this area in the next couple of days. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that it's against the Constitution. This is a federal landmark. They have no right to do this. Uh, I'm in the process of suing the city right now for First Amendment violations, and this is just going to add to it. How about the digging up of the X down here? Isn't that amazing, the rush job of digging up the X? That's a bit of a joke, I think. Uh, they said they didn't want anyone to trip over the Xs. It makes no sense at all. All it was was tape. D did you put that X there? I put that X down there 19 years ago, and every couple of weeks we uh, we refresh it. It's tape. It's not, it's not paint. And uh, as the cars run over it, of course, it wears it down. So we replace it, and we've kept it going for all these years, and we're going to do it again. And again, I haven't seen Robert Groden, not Richard Groden, in about three, four years, but many times I've gone up there and done documentaries and made films with him. He, of course, helped on the film JFK, if you're a radio listener. There he is on screen for TV viewers. Everybody can find the free feed at Infowars.com forward slash show. A fusion of all the different reporter feeds we're going to have over the next few days. Bookmark that. This is the real media. Ask Robert Groden uh, to talk more about uh, how the police and mainstream media uh, have been behaving and how the mainstream media just ran you off from behind the grassy knoll. Hey, we're live. We're live, sir. Sorry. Uh, yeah, his, Alex's next question is about how the pol police and the mainstream media have been acting to everybody here towards you personally. Have you seen anything today or, or the, uh, as the event unfolded? Well, the uh, alternative newspaper here in Dallas, the Dallas Observer, has been extremely supportive. They're really concerned about the First Amendment. And uh, they've written uh, over 40 articles dealing with uh, what the city's tried to do to me. Uh, the Dallas Morning News, on the other hand, has uh, taken the point of view that uh, I don't even exist. That's right. Uh, get, get him to talk about the Dallas Morning News and BLO and their history, of their 50-year history of covering up the JFK murder. You talk about BLO and their 50-year history of covering up the murder? Well, I mentioned a minute ago the uh, uh, the Dallas Observer. They just about three weeks ago did an amazingly uh, in-depth article about how the uh, uh, the Bilo Corporation has been involved with a, quote, city of hate for all of this time and how they fed the uh, that, that attitude of hate. 